This is the Skin Science Podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and here we'll investigate everything skin science and dissect it from a scientific perspective, analyze it from a medical perspective, critique it from a consumer perspective, and give insight from an industry perspective. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Dr. Thomas Hitchcock, and here we are talking about everything skin science. Unfortunately, today we do not have Angela McDonald in the studio. She is stuck in Aspen. Um, hopefully, she's about to board a flight to head back to us. But uh, we do have Dr. Brian Jones with us uh, again in the studio. Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, hello, everyone. <laughs> I didn't know if I was supposed to be prompted or not. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also have a, a newbie uh, to our uh, to our institution, Dr. Jose Maldonado. Uh, he's oh, that's another newbie, but that's not the, that's not Jose. Uh, so he's in the back there with uh, Alan, so uh, and Seti, who are our production staff. Everybody say hello. Hi, everyone. All right, all right, and then now I'm introducing Dr. Gregory Lawrence, who is uh, happens to be in town today, and we had a discussion about the uh, topic for today, and he, I thought that he'd be interested, and he was indeed uh, to come say hello. And so let me give you a little bit of background. Before uh, he introduces himself, uh, Dr. Gregory Lawrence is a cosmetic surgery specialist. He's received his MD degree from the University of Texas at Houston Medical School. Uh, Dr. Lawrence fulfilled his residency at St. Francis Family Practice at the University of Tennessee and completed a fellowship in advanced women's health. Uh, also at the University of Tennessee. Dr. Lawrence has served as a diplomat of the American Academy of Family Practice and the American Society of Cosmetic Breast Surgery. Welcome to the podcast, Greg. Thank you, Thomas. Love to be here. It's going to be a great topic. Yes. And so you're all probably wondering what the topic is, and that is going to be something that is near and dear to my heart, which is biome care. Now, some of you might not exactly know what we're going to talk about with the word biome care, um, but we're going to uh, elucidate all that in a second. Um, but really quickly, I did want to start a little a new thing. If, if any of you follow me on Instagram, you probably know that I am a mechanical puzzle box enthusiast. And so I, it's my hobby. Some people spend money on cars, being Brian. Uh, <laughs> some people spend money on clothes, which would be Angela. And I spend my money on puzzle boxes. And so I brought one here today. This is my brand new one. I got it uh, actually uh, just this weekend. And this is uh, a puzzle box that's made of wood. And I was starting to solve it. Uh, and I, it was just so cool that I had to share it. And so I don't know if, yeah, which camera are we on here? Uh, right here. Okay. Thomas, I have to say something about puzzle boxes. All right. Um, I always had a high opinion of you. You know, I've known you for a good number of years, right? <laughs> yes. And uh, Thomas has lots of letters behind his name. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, uh, people talk very, uh, uh, talk with a lot of respect when they talk about you. My you grandfather um, was the biggest genius I've ever known. And he um, was a puzzle guy. And uh, literally, he would build them thems himself and uh, would challenge other people to be able to solve the puzzles. That's amazing. And uh, so when, you, when I found out you had this uh, puzzle vibe, I said, <laughs> wow. Yes, it's an obsession. I mean, I'm not going to tell you how much this one costs. I mean, you would probably get mad at me for spending that on a piece of wood. But this is actually probably a third of the price of of some of the ones that I've, I've bought. And this one, uh, it's actually, I, I wish I could solve it for you today, but I don't want to spend too much time, but the intricacy of what goes into this, like little drawers pop out with little like metal keys and stuff. And you got to find where to put them. It's amazing. I think I'll probably make a video of me solving this and stick it online for anybody who's interested in, in it. And I'll also put the uh, manufacturer of this. He's a small, uh, woodworking guy. And I, you know, it's not like a big company. And so I, I do like to support those people as well. Brian and I are both interested, aren't we? Yeah. We'll be watching that. Oh, sure. You <laughs> bet. Well, I actually got him a puzzle, but it was actually too easy, I think, for you. I think no, you they're it. all, I, I like easy ones it, uh, too. In about 10 minutes or no, five I, minutes. Well, that's true. I did. But yeah. I like easy ones too, because when I come, when people come to my house, I like to hand them puzzles and they get frustrated if it's one that takes hours. So you, you do want some that are relatively easy. You are my grandfather. Yeah. <laughs> but interesting. I mean, like, even if you look at the detail here on this, that you have these little panels here and I was just fiddling around with it, and I found if you like press this one here, you can see it kind of goes up. And then eventually if you take that out, there's actually a metal key in there. And so I don't know if you can see that, but, um, so that's the, the part that's like, if you press on the wrong side, you think it's just like the rest of them. That's the stuff that like gets me high because I just, <laughs> I find that this, they call these sequential discovery puzzles. 
Uh, so I, anyway, I'll get off that topic. But I want to share a new puzzle every time and kind of like get people looking into puzzle boxes because I, these you got to use your brain, right? And so if you're going to uh, use your brain, this is one of the great ways to do it. It's also relaxing. So at the same time, you're kind of yeah. you know, stretching. Anyway, today we're talking about biome care. So um, it's kind of a, I'm not sure if I coined the term or if we coined the term, but uh, it may have been out there already. But the reason why I use the term biome care in, in lieu of skin care is not because we're saying skin care is bad. It's because we're saying that when we're talking about the skin, one of the things that we're starting to see uh, through science as well as medicine is that you cannot just care for the human part of your skin. You also have to think about the microbes that live on the skin. And anybody that's listened to any of these podcasts know that's a big deal for me. Microbiology, uh, the skin microbiome is something that I've been spending almost the, the better part of a decade, if not more than that, because even in my doctorate, I was using prokaryotic systems to look at DNA damage and repair. And so uh, we actually at Crown have uh, started, or not started, we've developed a uh, technology that actually we believe is one of the first legitimate biome cares that will be on the market, uh, if not the first uh, legitimate. And so today I wanted to go through um, several, seven different statements of, uh, regarding biome care and what that means, uh, and then discuss whether they're fact or fiction and kind of uh, some of the details behind it. Now, because... Um, Angela's not here to kind of bring it down to the consumer level. We're going to need to kind of all think about, you know, because we're all doctors uh, in this room for the most part, in one way or another. So uh, you, we can challenge each other to try and boil it down. Uh, if we hear each other getting a little too lofty, we'll try to boil it down for, uh, for our consumer base that's, that's listening to this. So the first kind of statement, uh, and I gave this talk in Aspen just this last week uh, on this topic, and so I used seven statements, the first of which is that probiotic skincare is a lie. And so there's a reason why I make that statement that probiotic skincare is a lie. Now, this is where, again, we're saying, is this fact or fiction? And so part of di dissecting this statement will help us to d determine whether it's fact or fiction. So probiotic skincare is a lie. So Brian, you're too close to this. I'm going to let Greg kind of react to that. And from, from a cursory perspective, like from before we talked, how you would have reacted to that statement and then kind of and then we can start talking about it more nuanced well I, I would say there's a lot of confusion about that um, surgeons like myself just you know we all know that um, we know we know that uh, 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 the sterile field isn't sterile right you know uh, and a lot of times our uh, OR staff will talk about oh you know hey doctor um, I, I touched that skin. It's no longer sterile. Well, it was never sterile. We may have prepped it. We may have uh, decreased the number of bacteria. Maybe briefly it was sterile. Yeah, we're, <laughs> but, th but that field is different than the drape right next to it. Mm -hmm. the, right, the drape right next to it is sterile. The instruments are sterile. But no matter how you prep that skin, there's a, there's a whole population. There's a city in there in the pores and the hair shafts. Right. Um, and so as a surgeon, we have to think about that all the time. And for, for me, um, for some of the cases that I do that, that are long, especially if we're moving the patient around, there's a sequential um, uh, 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 assignment of duties to make sure that that field stays as clean as possible. Right. You'd never use the word sterile if you knew what you were talking about. Right. Even with, uh, so our company makes uh, microneedling devices, and a lot of people don't understand, you know, one of the things that... Uh, drives me nuts is when people talk about uh, treating over acneic lesions. Now, um, some of that's contraindicated, you know, based on the label. But when they treat over those, their 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 reason why they don't want to treat over is because they don't want to um, drag uh, acneic bacteria across the skin and cause more acne. And my reaction to that is that's not the way that the microbiome works. Is if you have an acneic lesion, you already have that bacteria all over your face. Right. right. Um, it's 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 and it's not. And again, we'll get down to whether that bacteria even causes acne. But uh, that's one of those misnomers that I think uh, people reasons why people use a lot of hand sanitizers all the time. And uh, of course, it's for viral reasons too. But you know, when you talk about bacteria, people cringe because they think dirty and they think um, you know dis disease and disgust, and they don't realize that they are whole bodies, no matter how clean they've try to scrub themselves, is teeming with bacteria from, from top to bottom. Um, fungus as well, um, archaea, you know, virus as well. Now, bacteria is more or less the most abundant micro, but they're all, fungus is actually pretty prevalent as well. Yeah. And so you know, when you think about probiotic skin care, so the, the, the real kind of question is, what does the word probiotic mean, right? So I'm going to read really quickly. There, the reason this statement came about was, 
in November of 20, uh, last year, November 23rd, uh, Allure magazine published an article called Probiotic Skin Care is a Lie. And uh, I'm going to read a, an excerpt from the beginning of that, which is um, from this author. She says, if you're reading this, I owe you an apology. About six years ago, there was a sudden rise in the number of products that claim to optimize the skin's microbiome. The formulas contain probiotics or live microorganisms derived from fermented foods or dirt, for example. Probiotic lace skin care ends up wearing a halo of scientific truth. But like all halos, it's not real. That's the mistake I and many other editors made when reporting on this phenomenon in the mid-teens. So she does go on to be fair uh, at the end of the article to say that um, perhaps uh, you know probiotic skin care in the future will not be a lie and that it, there is uh, potential there for probiotic skin care. But currently at the time of the writing, she felt that it was a lie based on what the products were out there were. And I think the reason why she felt this way, and I mean, I've had a lot of reactions to this. You know, some people have said she was, you know, not very nice for doing this. They've used other words, but, you know, not very nice for writing this. But I cannot say I blame her necessarily. Or the, there's actually been several articles that have kind of echoed this after she had written this. And the reason I don't blame her is because the term probiotic has been more or less, more or less bastardized over the last decade or so. And part of that is because people have taken what's known about the gut microbiome and tried to one for one trade it for the skin and made a, have made a lot of assumptions. And most of the culprits have been, unfortunately, um, the industry, which you know we, we are part of. Um, and it's because I think um, you know for you to have a legitimate skin probiotic, as we'll discuss in a bit, it requires a change of infrastructure, which is going to be significant investment of money and resources. And so I don't blame her, but really in order for us to kind of uh, take uh, a look at whether, you know, probiotic skincare is still currently a lie, if it, you know, and why it was a lie in her opinion in the past 10 years, we kind of have to go to statement two, which is that probiotic, uh, a, a probiotic is a probiotic, meaning a probiotic is a pro, I don't know how else to say that, but you know, it is what it is. It is they're yeah. all the same. Probiotics are probiotics. So if, if I'm taking a probiotic for my gut, it should be useful for my skin, for my hair, for my toenails. You know, uh, I'm not sure if there's toenail probiotics, but there probably should be. And we'll, there should we'll, be. Yeah. <laughs> but um, what is, uh, so Brian, when I say a probiotic is a probiotic, um, without getting into what we already know, kind of what is your take on that, you know, for, if you think of it from a consumer perspective? Well, again, I think it goes with all, uh, you know, cosmetics and skincare products is that, uh, you know, everything is one and the same as towards when you look at an uh, uh, ingredient listing or claims that are being made. Everybody tries to go on the same bandwagon, uh, make the same claims, or especially if it's really a hot claim. Uh, and, you know, who's the first one and then who's the, the next one to come out with it is towards trying to, to, to capture the, the, the market. And every, the market's quite large. Right. Um, so I think it's just a case that... Uh, um, you know, the, um, the different marketing groups are seeing what uh, is interesting or what resonates with uh, c consumers and says that's what we're going to go with. Uh, and so I think that's, you know, it's something new and novel. It's something that's um, interesting, I think, to everyone because everyone kind of relate to it as far as to some extent. Right. Um, so I think that's, it's just simply, um, you know, for most individuals, just a, a, another um another product uh, versus it being actually I mean, consumers consumer, to just yeah. look at it and say, okay, it's just another, it's just another cream. Well, well I, I think that they think that it, again, that it has some uniqueness to it and that's mm -hmm. what resonates. And that's why it's expanding in the marketplace as much as it has. You mean probiotic, Pro quote, quote, unquote, quote, probiotics, yes, yeah. essentially something to do with uh, um, bacteria on your skin. Uh, okay. And that's what they, they know. So they don't know the difference between bacteria in the skin or the gut or any different locations within the body. It's just bacteria is bacteria. And that therefore right, and that's where the term probiotic, again, is kind of doing them a disservice, right? Correct. Because, you know, technically it is a probiotic in some capacity. Um, you know, if, if it's something that's been used in the gut for 20, 30 years, you could call it a probiotic, but it becomes a little bit, not disingenuous, or maybe for some disingenuous, but it becomes a little bit uh, unhelpful. Unhelpful when uh, you are doing that and then you're putting on the skin. Because then the, the question is, if you know it's going to be applied to the skin, can you legitimately call it a probiotic at that point? So let's say lactobacillus casei, 
great for the gut, to, and we'll get into a little bit about even more about that. But that species uh, is it, it can be good for the gut, and so the real question is: is it also good for the skin? And where are you getting that information? Um, and is it just that you're making an assumption, or has there actually been clinical tests uh, that have shown that? Um, so let me really quickly read, and we've done this, I think, on the podcast before about definitions of probiotics. So I won't belabor it, but for those who may not have seen that episode or heard that episode, um, the Merriam-Webster, which is kind of like the layperson's definition source, the, the dictionary there, is they actually have a definition that says a microorganism like lactobacillus that when consumed, as in food or a dietary supplement, maintains or restores beneficial bacteria to the digestive tract. So uh, then they also say also a product or preparation that contains such microorganisms. So really that adds to the confusion because they're specific to the digestive tract. So that definition I would say is outdated. Um, it's uh, reductive because we uh, know be with the boom of metagenomics and, and gene sequencing that has become cheap relatively, uh, we know that every tissue has some sort of microbiome, some, sub, some sort of microorganism. So we have to ask ourselves, are there going to be products now or in the future that are going to deem to be uh, for the same purpose as what we do with the gut, taking bacteria for the gut? And Thomas, to your yeah. point, there was a paper that came out just a couple years ago using some of the new technology uh, for evaluating um, basically a healthy person that died. They were able to look at the... Um, the uh, 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 the spine and the okay. discs and the yep, yep. vertebral discs. And they were able to use technology to find out what organisms um, were in. Again, this was a healthy individual. Right. There were, there were several hundred microorganisms in that particular tissue. It's making us rethink everything. In the brain as well. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> in our Beauty and the Bacteria series, which I recommend everybody go and watch, or we do have a... Um, a synopsis. I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's available online or not, but we can make it online. We can make it online. By the time this comes out, maybe we'll have it online. But um, that series is available online uh, at www.beautyandthebacteria.com. And one of them talks about um, skin deep. I think is the episode, and it talks mm -hmm. about that even in the in the in the womb, we actually have some microbes that uh, have been shown to infiltrate. And, and interestingly, they're skin associated, uh, as far as like Staphylococcus epidermidis and Cutibacterium acnes. There's actually found in small amounts in the womb. And so we do, you know, what people have been thinking for the last probably 10, 15, 20 years is that we get all of our microbes from the birth canal. And there's been some studies that have shown differences in, in the uh, predisposition to inflammatory skin issues if, it's born, if someone's born by C-section versus vaginally. Um, now, that being said, a lot of what comes out of the uh, vaginal canal is our lactobacilli and such. Um, because that is a specific niche in the body. But if you look at the uh, human skin, either child or adult, we know that lactobacillus does not make a large constituent of our microbiome. And so if it was the seeding in the, in the vaginal canal that actually drives our microbiome, why don't we have more lactobacilli? Why do we have C. acnes and, and staph epidermis and staph aureus? It's for a couple reasons. The first is because the niches tend to attract uh, certain bacteria that, uh, because of the environment they create. And so uh, is lactobacillus suitable, suited to live on the skin, especially on the face and, 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 the, and such. Um, but then uh, also in the womb, if you have them already in there, uh, you know, it, just, it, it, talk, it just speaks to the fact that there's perhaps, I don't know if, I, if we want to get into it, that there's a design here, but there's, there is a symbiosis mm -hmm. Um, and where it's cyclical. Uh, and so uh, if, if it wasn't cyclical, then we wouldn't have such consistency now uh, from person to person as far as, and now there has been uh, also literature, not literature, but, um, well, yes, literature, but then there's been like news articles and such talk about how everybody has like a finger, a microbiome is like a fingerprint. Um, and while I can't say I've done that research, so I don't know how, uh, how legitimate that is always, because we also know that if you live with somebody, you tend to, start adapting your microbiome to be more like them if you have pets similar. Right. Um, but uh, that being said, we do know that if I compare my face to your face um, and then my you know, armpit to your armpit, the, the micro, and that sounds kind of weird in a sentence, <laughs> but um, you know, we know that the microbiomes between our faces, although there may be some differences, they're way more similar than our own armpit to our face because there's just specific microbes that live there. Also, 
there's transient microbes because as we touch things, we attract microbes from the environment, but then there's certain ones that engraft and there's certain ones that are transient. And a swab of the skin is gonna pick up both, but it won't pick up things that are deep mm -hmm. in the skin. And that's where I think we start to open up a, I don't wanna say can of worms or Pandora's box, but we, we open up a, a, a bigger uh, phenomena than we really knew by just taking swabs. And there's companies that, and we're gonna, sh we, uh, we, uh, we can't show it today, but we'll talk about it. We actually did a little uh, case study in our office where we sure. took some stickers um, these little stickers to do metagenomics of, and we saw some interesting results when we did this. But before we go on, I do want to talk about the other definitions here really quick. Uh, the World Health Organization calls the probiotics a live microorganism, which when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit on the host. So that's broader. So we like that one, but what it doesn't tell us is how that health benefit is conferred and why that means that a probiotic for the gut may not be or the skin, because here it's saying when administered in adequate amounts confers the health benefit on the host. Therefore, a lactobacillus casei that I ingest is a probiotic, but it doesn't say that, because then technically it's a probiotic regardless of how you apply it, because in one way when it's administered. So it just kind of leaves out a small facet yeah, there. Though it does say the last piece about being health for the, so again, is it really truly health as far as lactobacillus as you're playing on the face versus in the gut? Well, yeah, you're, you're right. It comes down to, the angle which you're looking at. So if right. I'm a company that wants to sell a lactobacillus well, in skincare, so, yeah. I could say it technically does meet that definition, just not on the skin. Yeah. You know, so. Well, and it's much easier for, again, mm -hmm. as far as all the food and dairy industry and everything else as far as growing lactobacillus. Right. Um, it's already been around for. Forever. Yeah, for many, many, yeah, for hundreds of years. Centuries. As yeah. As, you know, from the time that it started making cheese and yeah. milk and everything else, so. Yeah. Yeah. Just to pause here, you know, so we're talking to basically um, how these bugs, you know, they're viruses, they're fungi, they're bacteria that mm -hmm. live on us are in a community with us. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, we've got uh, newly uh, credentialed Dr. Maldonado with us who uh, will tell us as an evolutionary biologist who study reptiles that uh, these this 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 community that we live in is huge for evolution. A lot of times DNA exchange happens through these um, organisms. And so it is a, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. It is. And it, interestingly, and it, actually with uh, some, some, actually with, with uh, uh, the timing of this is kind of crazy. When I, when I flew here, um, I had an observation on the airplane. Uh, oh, I thought you were going to say you exchanged DNA with I, Well, I probably <laughs> did. I probably did. Uh, but, uh, um, but uh, on the airplane, there was a gal who was walking down the aisle um, with a really good mask on, by the way. If you're going to wear a mask, wear a good one, right? Well, like an um, N95? Yeah, and, but it looked like it was custom fit. And uh, anyway, gotcha. so, but she looked like she was trying to walk between two glass plates so she didn't get oh, close she to one or the other. <laughs> and the, the point is, is that there could be some value in her uh, masking, but she, this doesn't need to lead to a fear right. of her being in community because we're not only in community with each other, and if we stop having an exchange of community, especially little kids and stuff, there could be some bad health effects. So yes. this is a great topic for just, there's so many applications for it. Right, and there's been um, research that showed that, for instance, people are, are pets that are um, domestic, and are all, all domesticated, but the ones that are uh, isolated. My dogs don't house. think that. Yeah. <laughs> well, think what? <laughs> that they're domesticated. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mine does. <laughs> um, but when, when they're isolated to like a house, like an urban environment, versus if they're let out to like roam on fields and stuff. The ones that are in the more rural areas tend to have way less uh, uh, atopic dermatitis and such and allergies. And I think humans as well, we know that more urban areas, people tend to have higher amounts of autoimmune. Autoimmune, but also inflammatory, which yes. is kind of tied together. Yeah, right. It's hard for me to hear. You know, when I was a kid, I was germaphobic. And I remember this one day that we were on the beach and I wouldn't touch my hot dog. You know, I did not want to touch the <laughs> hot dog. So though? I had this paper towel and I dropped it in the sand. Oh, and my, no. I guess my mom and dad were either the worst parents ever or the best. And <laughs> they they said, yeah, that was your wash it off or you <laughs> just lost dinner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's true. I mean, even, uh, I mean, it sounds gross, but frankly, there's very little that is going to really harm you if you eat something off the ground, unless you're like in a place where there's a lot of fecal material or something that's going to have E. coli. I would say definitely don't. On a farm, maybe. Don't eat we stuff agree. The we yeah. agree. <laughs> yeah, but um, you know that there's that whole like people say these are the five second rule and stuff. 
there, there's a there's a legitimacy to the fact that just because it falls on the floor doesn't mean it's i mean of course it depends on which floor we're talking about for sure i'm like <laughs> on a bathroom floor i probably wouldn't <laughs> eat something <laughs> off of there but uh so th there there is you got to use common sense um and uh we're kind of getting way off track here but again like even when you're talking about with surgical making incisions and stuff the fact is you can try to prep that surgery site but there's stuff beneath where you prepped that's event and that's why sometimes there are um you, you can get some infections with things like staph epidermidis and cutibacterium acnes which are typically because uh, especially acute bacterium, it's anaerobic. So if you get that, if you get enough of that down into a surgical site, it could cause an issue because it's still going to want to live there. Mm -hmm. It's going to try to survive, uh, but it's not supposed to be there. And so the body will react yeah. to that. Um, you know, the, the nuance of this is amazing as a surgeon, you know, the staph epi, um, is hardly ever a pathogen that hurts us with uh, standard surgeries. Mm -hmm. But anytime you're putting in a device, right, it likes you're to stick in to an orthopedic screw or a, a defibrillator or a breast implant, you got to worry about that that organism that usually is benign because it makes a lot of biofilm. Yeah. It scars things down. And yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, staph, uh, and actually, and we're going to talk about it in a little bit in a second. But you know, um, the way that these bacteria interact with each other on the skin. If you take away the other bacteria, it changes because it changes how that bacteria is going to function. And you mentioned the biofilm, and part of what depresses the amount of biofilm the staph secretes is C. acnes. Crazy. And so, you know, we think of these in isolation. Which is the organism that causes acne in most dermatologists. Well, that's what they mind. say that it <laughs> yes. does. Yes. Um, but I, I'm, I'm wanting to throw a little bit of a wrench here, and we'll talk. That's one of our statements. Yeah. Can't wait. <laughs> but uh, so when we when we talk about probiotics now, you know. We, we have to be careful. Those definitions we talked, oh, there's that last definition that I forgot. This is the definition that is actually from the International Cooperation of Cosmetic Regulations. When Doris Day was on the, the show last, we, we, we talked about this. Um, you know, it's live or dormant microorganisms is what they call probiotic. So in essence, they are saying that a flesh-eating bacteria could be considered a probiotic, which I think is kind of silly. Um, and there's probably a bunch of other things that could be considered probiotic that we probably wouldn't want as well. So really that definition s certainly does not meet the need from a, a medicine um, or a scientific perspective. And I would say as a consumer, I wouldn't want that to be the definition either. Um, I think that is written by uh, people that want to be allowed to use things like lactobacillus and call it a probiotic on, in skincare in, and not feel any type of um, ethical, you know, what's the word? <laughs> <laughs> uh, misgivings yeah or repercussions <laughs> or whatever I, I don't feel like a lot of industry is nefarious per se I think that they're just trying to find an ingredient that has a marketing hook and yeah. um, without doing any of the work to, to, to actually show that it does something um, that being said well, uh, and a lot of companies utilize information from suppliers and the supplier will say this that's true. and then that's therefore true. it becomes gospel and therefore it makes the claims and they can sell it and everybody's happy. And that's the truth. And it's unfortunate, but it's the truth is that when you formulate skincare, what, you know, anybody that doesn't know, knows biology or chemistry knows something in isolation. And we just talked about it with bacteria. Something in isolation may not have the same effect as something in a formulation. So you can actually uh, neutralize or you can make something, you know, completely useless depending on how you formulate it. And so uh, a lot of times, just because of the way that cosmetics are regulated, if you have it in there in a certain amount, you can make a claim, um, even if it's possibly a neutralized. Right. And that's a problem. Because um, uh, now there are good skincare companies will test them out and, and at least uh, try to validate those claims somewhat. But we all know that there's plenty of them out there that don't. Um, that you just use the claims from you know the ingredients manufacturers and uh, Needless to say, as l I think they're kind of thinking as long as it doesn't hurt somebody, uh, it's, it's no harm, no foul. But as we can see, Lori, uh, is it L'Oreal or uh, Clinique? Is that the same? Are they owned? No, Clinique okay, is they're separate. Is, yeah, they're separate, two different companies. Yeah, so I believe Clinique has, is in, currently in a lawsuit um, regarding this because they were claiming that they had probiotics in the skin in a certain product, and it turned out to be postbiotics, I believe. And so, of course, somebody sued them. Uh, I think, I believe it's a class action lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And so other companies have followed suit as far as still or some are still like using postbiotics or paraprobiotics and calling them probiotics. But a lot of them have shied away now and they're, they're using the correct terms of postbiotic. Um, and there are legitimate postbiotics because just like any other skincare ingredient, 
it could have a legitimate purpose. Like I believe there are some lactobacillus strains that can have some UV boosting, um, UV SPF boosting activities from some of their metabolites. Thomas, but, yeah. I'm a doctor. Yeah. I need some help. Okay. Yeah, can you uh, define for me um, uh, the difference between a postbiotic and a probiotic? Sure. So a, a probiotic is, and now we're going to get into that definition in a second, but a, let me just get into that definition first. So um, in 2015, a group of uh, scientists got together and published, and in that publication, they defined uh, certain facets that uh, microorganisms should have to be considered probiotic for any given application. And they gave five different uh, kind of uh, facets here. You can divvy it up however you want, but the first was it has to display high resistance to stressors specific to that location. The second is it has to have the capacity to survive in the relevant area of the body. The third is it has to lack any transferable antibiotic resistance gene. The fourth is it has to be able to confer clear benefits through modulation of the resident microbiome. And the last is it has to be non-pathogenic, non-toxic, and provide protection against disease-causing microorganisms. So th all that can be boiled down to, for it to be a legitimate probiotic for any given application, it has to be able to engraft or survive and actually thrive on the area of application. So if you put in the gut, it has to be able to survive and thrive and engraft into that area. And the skin has to be able to survive and thrive and engraft in that area and actually confer benefit via several ways. First is it can't be bad for you. So it can't be pathogenic or have antibiotic resistance gene or be toxic. And on the flip side, it has to be good, meaning it has to protect you against bad organisms as well as uh, uh, modulate the microbiome so that it actually becomes more balanced per se. So that basically is a great holistic definition of uh, what a, a probiotic should be in every given scenario because it's specific to the application. Um, to anybody that's a consumer that's listening, let me just basically say that it has to be a bacterial strain, and we'll get into why that last word is a very important strain, but it has to be a bacterial strain or a microbial strain, let's say, because who's to say it couldn't be in the future something else, micro, whether it's a fungus or whatnot, or, whatever, yeah. uh, or a virus, yeah, or a path, uh, phage or something. But uh, it has to be a, a microbe of some strain that when you put it on or in your body actually sticks around, becomes part of your innate microbiome and then actually uh, is able to survive and, and act to help you either by what it, it secretes or it produces or by taking up space and keeping other bad things away. Um, and so that's really what a probiotic should be defined as. A postbiotic is the things that it produces. So um, all, the, all of the molecules that uh, any given micro produces that confers a benefit. So in the instance uh, if, of um, like a lactobacillus, uh, if you have it in a tank and you're fermenting it to produce more lactobacillus, you can actually remove all the cells from that. You can filter out all the cells. And in the soup that it was growing in, are gonna, it, that's called the postbiotic because it's what is left behind. Now, a lot of people would call that the waste or the poo of the microbes, which is completely not true because it's not like uh, microbes can't be equated to an organism like us. They're unicellular. And um, what they do is they also metabolize things to um, surround themselves with it so that they can protect themselves, like mm -hmm. antioxidants, or sometimes they'll produce enzymes. They're creating their own environment. That's right. So yeah. They're conditioning. They're, I, used to, I, I, I think I coined a term called microbioforming. And I coined that back when I was pitching my idea originally about 10 years ago because it's like it's terraforming. You know how you, the science fiction, you go out and you mm -hmm. find a planet, you try to condition it so that it is suitable for habitation. Uh, habitation? Habitation? Uh, habitation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they make up words and I don't even know it. Um, and is so, Elon joining us on Zoom any minute now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he just heard you. Yeah. He just heard that. <laughs> Elon, uh, I'd love to, uh, to get your thoughts on microbiome. But, um, uh, but yeah, so microbioforming is similar in the sense that microbes actually kind of terraform their own niche. And it's more uh, nuanced than we all even realize because a lot of people think when you put bacteria on the skin that they're what we call planktonic, that they just kind of float around freely as individual microbes. But that's not the way that bacteria works. They actually form colonies. They actually do secrete things like biofilms to kind of encapsulate their colony. And then they put in these biofilms the substances they need to kind of create their own you know, special home. The problem is that 
some of the ways they interact with each other can become conducive to formation of things like comedones and such. And interestingly, there is more and more research about interaction. Be a blackhead. A blackhead or even a s certain form of a zit yes. if it's open or closed. But, um, you know, there's interaction between even bacteria and fungus. And there, really, we're just n now starting to learn why we end up having uh, these, er these interactions and why our skin reacts certain ways. And, it's, and interestingly, there's a lot of people that like to try to make it super uh, simple, but it's not because there's genetic components, of our own genetic components. There are uh, bacterial components, of course. There's uh, pollution. Uh, there's the skincare products that you use that maybe you shouldn't be. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's just quite a bit that goes into why we have certain skin issues. And you know, uh, that's where probiotics for the skin could come in if we can find a legitimate probiotic because it can help to condition and deal with some of these issues. So most of the, um, the industry, and we talked about you know, the, the lawsuits that have been happening, and Brian, you, you and I have been talking about this for a while. Uh, when, when we look at the inkies of a lot of these things that, uh, that claim to be probiotic in nature, we tend to see things like what? Well, you brought up that lactobacillus seems to be all, always common, but it's more pr uh, postbiotic versus Probiotic. I mean, in terms of when you look at the ingredients, but uh, or storylines that are um, again more of, of uh, material that is actually used by the bacteria, not so much the bacteria themselves. Right. And now there are some. For instance, I'm looking at one right right here. There's an inky list that has um, L case Lactobacillus casei and Lactobacillus acidophilus, which are both well known species for the gut. Now, they also are heat de deactivated. Now. Yeah. Why? Why would we heat deactivate something that we're calling a probiotic? Does it, is it still probiotic at that point? Well, I think based on your definitions, I think it still needs to be a viable or alive. Because it can't engraft if it's dead, right? Yeah. yeah. Is there benefit to having a dead bacteria on the skin? Well, it provides nutrients to the other bacteria. Okay. It could also but it could all, I mean, provide other things that are not. I mean, if you crack open a bacteria, there's stuff in there that maybe we don't want on our skin, right? Correct. What uh, would be the reason for the heat treatment? To kill them so that they, because the thing is, you have to think about if I put bacteria in a typical formulation of skincare, what happens? There's preservatives in there. Um, also, That's why you have preservatives and, you know, the product will go, you know, rancid or, or turn or uh, no longer stable. And if there's anything in that, um, let's say they put a prebiotic in there, which is the food source for a probiotic, then you start to have metabolism of certain things in the cream, and then you end up with a different consistency of a cream than you bottled. Right, right. And so if you legitimately have live bacteria in it, you have to think about what happens if it's at room temperature and it's digesting or, um, you know, if you don't have preservative, what else could grow in there? Uh, and so these are all, and this is one of the reasons why most companies have not innovated here, because it's not easy. It requires research and infrastructure that most are not willing to invest in because they can slap a label, uh, kill a bacteria or use a postbiotic, slap a label as probiotic, and people will see that and think, healthy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's something I want because all these people. And so I think this, this author that basically said probiotic skincare is a lie felt responsible and because they were the people that were saying you should go out and spend 100 bucks on this cream because it's probiotic and it has science behind it. And now they're saying, oh, what they were telling me was science was gimmick. And I feel responsible that I need to tell you that all that was a lie that I bought into. And so when we look at these inkies, she's not wrong. If you call that probiotic, it's a lie. I mean, it well, may not right. be in nefarious, fact, but it's a lie. Yeah. In fact, I mean, it's really pretty much the bane of you know, uh, most cosmetic companies is having bacteria in your product. Is towards right. the, that's why they have preservative systems. That's why they have microbiology departments is towards testing to make sure the products are clean or relatively clean. Right. Uh, you've got FDA looking at recalls on different types of products is towards contaminations. So it's really kind of um, the opposite of, of what's been part of the industry for, for the very beginning is towards you didn't want bacteria. Now we're trying to say... Maybe there, you do. Maybe you do. It's but, the right ones. Yeah, and I think uh, for those of you who are listening that are not uh, privy to how we make skincare, is that we actually have to uh, test each uh, product that we make, and we call it micro, which is you have to test to see whether or not the preservative system works or whether there's bacteria in it 
at a certain amount of time. You have to put them on what we call stability. So you put in certain temperature chambers for a certain amount of months, and you have to see whether or not it stays like it's supposed to, whether it grows anything. So there's actually some uh, quality control that goes into making skincare that um, most people don't realize in order to, and it makes it difficult to do that if the infrastructure is keep back, like you were just saying, keep bacteria out. Yeah. And you actually want to have it in. Now, we'll get into in a second um, why uh, we've actually been able to start doing this legitimately. Um, but first, let's go on to our, our number three uh, uh, statement. Uh, Thomas, yeah. can I um, just ask you, I was, you, you used a term uh, a few times in the first couple times. I thought that might have just been some distortion. You know, Chuck Norris spends a lot of time in this studio, you know, <laughs> and, you know maybe Chuck, I just, hey, that's probably Chuck Norris. No, but you, you, but then you used it the third time and I could tell it wasn't Chuck. So you All said right. inky. Ah, so this yes. Is a, this is an industry star term that you and uh, Brian know. So uh, mm -hmm. tell this doctor. Okay. It's just the ingredient list. And so if you look on the back of your skincare, all I the, love that word. all the inky. different, oh, uh, <laughs> is it the same as pack, PI package insert? Uh, an inky can be on an insert, but uh, package inserts typically for like medical devices or, or drugs when they don't have room on the label of the actual box. Mm -hmm. um, some some skincare will have a package insert, right. um, especially OTC, which right. is uh, something that has a, a, a monograph drug like a sunscreen mm -hmm. or a retinoid. Um, but typically, uh, skincare will put it on the back of the bottle or on the box. And it's that list of ingredients a lot of times that look like Greek because they're long words that you don't know what they mean. Um, a lot of people are going to be uh, appreciate the fact that I asked that question. <laughs> and I do want to say this, just a shout out to all the skincare companies out there. Use a QR code. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Inky. Yeah, yeah. Do your inkies on a QR code. I don't I love know. If, them. I don't know if uh, the FDA would allow that, but because um, there are regulations as to whether you, what you can do, but po possibly. Uh, no, you couldn't. Okay, never mind. Okay, interesting. Okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah, the FDA is very specific about the, that. You could put the listing there and a QR code. And That's the, true. And you could That's put true. more information you know, for the QR code, but you'd have to put the listing there. Actually, I actually, just as a side note, I actually saw a company that was doing augmented reality to where when you looked at it through your phone, it like called out all the ingredients and what they were for next to it and like you could like scroll oh, the I like it. list I, like it. I think it'll start i mean that's a little bit of that, Cos cosmetic surgeons like augmentation I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think it's uh very cool but it would require for every i mean people uh skincare companies you typically make you know a dozen or so products new per year that's a lot of investment for every inky list but um anyway how are we doing on time uh alan uh we're at 50 minutes okay well we'll we're, we might need to go over a little bit today but um, so number, uh, statement number three is that microbiome diversity means skin health. So that is something where, uh, I really kind of am trying to drive home that again, the skin is not the same as the gut because this is something that is a staple of gut health. A lot of people accept that the more diverse your gut microbiome is, the healthier your gut is. Now that may be uh, true for uh, the gut. Um, however, if you look at skin, that's not necessarily true. And, and a lot of that comes into play when you think about the structure of skin. So what's on the surface, when people think of skin as very much like saran wrap almost. Um, but the thing is, this, this, the skin has a lot of invaginations in the skin. We call them um, hair follicles or, or sweat glands. There, there's more fancy names pores. for those. Pores, yeah. Um, and Dry tides. Yes, I guess those are imaginations too. And interestingly, the wrinkles will have a, a different microbiome slightly than a non-wrinkle just simply because of the structure of the skin. But um, in the hair follicles, you actually have 10 times more surface area than you do on the surface of your skin. And so you also have uh, on the surface of your skin, we, we have a stratum corneum, which is, makes a barrier that's difficult to get through. But in the infundibulum uh, and below, which is the hair follicle uh, and below, you actually have direct access to the cells, the, the epidermal keratinocyte cells, um, as well as they're surrounded by immune cells, um, and which uh, there's a lot in the skin. It's probably, probably the number one immune organ, frankly. That's correct. Yeah. And so you think about what lives in the pore is actually the, has a huge influence, not just on your skin, but systemically because of your immune system. And uh, so uh, Dr. Lee at UCLA looked in the skin and found that about across the board, whether you have acne or not, around 89% of your uh, follicle microbiome is C. acnes. That, that bug that you, you were saying, you were alluding to before that people think Even cause acne. Even if you don't have acne. Even if you don't have acne. Interestingly, when you swab skin, 
that is uh, a lesion for a topic dermatitis, which is another inflammatory skin issue, you actually find less C. acnes than on non-lesional skin. So that means if you have a patch of eczema, you have less C. acnes on that patch than you do on your healthy skin or on a healthy individual. And you know, that's it's almost like that's a good bacteria. It sounds like it, that's right? Yeah. Lead in there. It's it's like, there's, <laughs> a, there's, some, there's a little evidence there. That's one piece of evidence. Right. That's one piece <laughs> of evidence that gives you a little bit pause about, well, how if C. acnes causes acne, how in the world is it that everybody in the face of the earth has it 89% in their follicles? Now, yes, some people have a little less, some people have 100%, um, but that's it's a good question. You know, the fact is, it's because doesn't necessarily cause acne and there's more to it than that now we'll get to uh, really quickly in a second a little bit more but if you look at old skin versus young skin you also have uh less c acnes on older skin and you have more diversity but i don't know if we would say that older skin is necessarily healthier skin most of us are trying to turn back the clock and so if we're saying that healthier skin or younger skin and healthier skin has more c acnes and less diversity um that is different. Dr. Brian, we're going to give Dr. Thomas a little extra time on this cast, right? I got to, <laughs> I got to have some answers here. All right. Yeah, we yeah, can always... see a lot of data over here on this screen. There's yeah, a lot we of could, data. Yeah, we could always split it into two, <laughs> two different uh, episodes if we go long enough, right? Um, I, I think Alan's getting scared now because he's thinking two hours. Oh, no. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, but the one thing that I skipped over was the, the diversity picture is that, you know, when you look at, uh, right now, you guys who are listening can't see it or even watching because I'm not putting it up, but there's a graph here on my screen, which is from Dr. Lee's lab. And uh, Dr. Lee showed that if you look at the difference between acneic patients and normative patients, people that don't have acne, um, actually, there's more diversity on the people who are healthy that don't have acne. I'm sorry, less diversity. Yeah. There's more diversity in people that have acne. Um, and then another study showed when they, and of course, these are, this is only N of three, um, where the other one was uh, much higher. And so there was a, the, the Dr. Lee study is pretty robust, but there's another study that I, I allude to here that was done in 2008, which was about four years earlier. And they showed that in three patients that had normative, healthy skin, they had almost, they had only, they could only find C. acnes, um, in their follicles, not on the surface, but in their follicles. And then the patients that had acne, they actually had staph epidermidis ingress into uh, the hair follicle. Now, you talked about staph epidermidis being considered a commensal. Yes. But why is it that we're seeing when people have acne, they have more staph epi in the follicle and less the acnes? Shouldn't it be the opposite if staph epi is a commensal? Right, right. Yeah, and so that you're asking, we have to ask Co the question. Commensal has the word community in it, correct? Commensal? Community? I, I guess. Communism. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it means they're hanging out together, right? Yes, yeah. that's correct. That's correct. And so commensals, almost you can think of as benign because th they just hang out there. They don't really necessarily hurt or help. Um, where I would call, you know, some people think commensal, they think it's beneficial. I would call symbiotic a beneficial microorganism, although commensal is kind of used in that way. But commensal is more, for me, like more benign or neutral. Um, and then uh, pathogenic would be if it, if it doesn't have a uh, benefit, but it's actually harmful. And so, you know, of course, there are some microbes that can change the way that they act based on their environment. I think staph epidermidis might be one. And part of that has to do with the way that C. acnes interacts with staph epidermidis. And we talked about really briefly before about the biofilms. And we'll get into that in a second. But my, my kind of own theory is that for people with acne that have less C. acnes or certain strains of C. acnes, you have to think about how two of these bacteria are interacting with each other in a anaerobic or microaerobic environment and whether they're, it's almost like a fight for dominance in the area that's typically only taken up by C. acnes. And so that is one. And then the other way could possibly be, you know, the metabolites of staph epidermidis that are typically kept on the surface by C. acnes those metabolites, what do they do when they get inside the follicle? Maybe they're the culprit that are causing some of these issues. And so the real question is, is uh, the C. acnes that's associated with acne, because some of the strains are, is it causing acne because they're inflammatory or is it causing acne because it's allowing ingress of the wrong bacteria or both or neither? These are the things that most people aren't asking because they're just assuming C. acnes causes acne. And for all those docs that are listening in who went to medical school more than 20 years ago, when you say C. acnes, you're talking about what they taught yeah. us was P. acnes. P. acnes, yeah. yeah. Actually, I believe it was corneobacterium 
initially Correct. was the genus. Yep. And then, uh, so it was always Acnes was a species, but it was Corneobacterium, so it was originally C. Acnes, and then it got termed Propionobacterium Acnes because they observed that it caused, uh, created propionic right. acid. That's correct. And then they said, well, there's a lot of Propionobacterium, but this one is exclusive to the skin, so we're now we're gonna call it Cutobacterium Acnes. And interestingly, uh, they even, when, now they're gone as far as to um, officially divide it into three distinct subspecies because they act so differently. And so there's three different subspecies on the skin. Um, and uh, because they act so differently, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, well, should we then be saying C. acnes without the subspecies when we're calling it a pathogen? Or should we say C. acnes acnes is a pathogen, C. acnes defendens is a symbiote? That's a good, qu it's a question, right? What do you think, Brian? Well, I think we're kind of going down the direction. At least we're biased in how we're. Oh, biased. we are very biased. So I have to say that uh, you know we're we're going to go mm -hmm. down that direction. But I think that's what's everything's going to lead to. So I think so too. I think uh, and we'll get and one of the statements will lead to this. So I'm not going to talk about it right in this second. But um, so right in front of me, I also we did a uh, uh, a little case study because you know we we see this in the literature. Uh, I've been studying these strains for almost a decade now, and so I know what I think is going to happen on people's skin when we when we look at uh, you know, using C. acnes as a modulation uh, or a modulator for the microbiome. Um, so f starting in 2017, I actually myself started applying uh, pure cultures of C. acnes of a specific strain um, to see what happened because all the research we were doing was showing that it was anti-inflammatory uh, and had antioxidant benefits. And so I wanted to test it out myself because so many people said C. acnes was uh, pathogen, I was like, I just don't believe that this strain is pathogenic. And so I put it on my skin and uh, I'll tell you, I did not get acne. If anything, it was the opposite. Um, and, uh, you know, we won't show any pictures today, but um, we actually saw where um, blackheads on individuals were disappearing. And, or at least um, from a, from a, from a, which I'm gonna call it a macro sense from observational or just yeah, because I didn't like, visual, we, yeah. we didn't necessarily zoom in on their skin, but and you, so I had to start asking the question, why? Why would you, why would it? And so you, when you start thinking about what is the food of C. acnes, it's the sebum that the skin creates. And so what is a blackhead? It's a plug of sebum and other things, you know, stuck in there uh, that becomes oxidized with oxygen and turns dark. And uh, C. acnes, we have found, uh, secretes a huge amount of antioxidants. So when you apply a lot of C. acnes, not only do they have antioxidants that are going to reduce the amount of oxidation on the skin, which is damaging to skin and cells in general. But um, it's also going to eat those plugs a little bit because that's like a buffet to them. And so I was actually uh, happy to see that, you know, my, my kind of hypothesis was correct as far as it not being a pathogen necessarily because it's under the species of C. acnes. But interestingly, we did a, a dermasqua, a dermasqueam, that's Dermasqueam? Yeah. Is that a brand name or is that a... Well, a D-Squeam is, is actually... Uh, so D-Squeam. Dermasqueam is a brand name. Yeah. We didn't do Dermasqueam. We did a D-Squeam, which yeah. is basically taking a really sticky sticker yeah. um, and putting it on your, your skin and then ripping it off, which sounds so fun, but uh, it actually doesn't hurt that bad. Uh, but uh, what, what you do is when you rip that... It's like ripping a Band-Aid off your skin, frankly. And so it also rips off, it rips out everything, meaning it rips out the bacteria on your skin, the bacteria in your follicles, um, the hair, <laughs> little villus hairs, villus hairs. And uh, squam, that's why they call it a squam. As as the, the and the skin and cells, the skin top cells, surface yeah. of skin cells. And so really what you can do is you can actually take these stickers after you do that, and you can um, basically through certain processes take out the bacteria, take out the skin cells, and you can do genetic analyses. So you can look at what we call 16S sequencing for uh, metagenomics for the bacteria, and you can actually down to the strain or the subspecies of each individual. And you were talking about that with the spine. Right, That's right. probably what they used with 16S sequencing. Um, and then also you can do genetic analysis on the human cells where you can look at you know, their individual gene variants and see whether they're predisposed to certain genetics and such. And so we had a guy, um, so one of the, uh, the spouses of one of our colleagues, um, he has uh, uh, sebaceous uh, dermatitis, right? Yeah. Is that right? Uh, it's not atopic. It's well, he's, it's more of a psoriasis. I mean, it's psoriasis. Well, again, it's. Uh, I think he's got a combination, but okay. I those, think those sebaceous conditions yeah. are yeah. sort of um, 
you know, they, there are several different sebaceous. But anyway, it was a, it was a, it was it a wasn't on, it wasn't the kind that's on your scalp though. It's on his face, directly okay. on his face. And I, so I know that so it's a dermatitis. Yeah. It is a dermatitis, yes. And um, it's well known that derma. Again, we talked about when you take the <clears> lesions and you s sample the lesions versus the normative skin. The dermatitis uh, under atopic or whether it's uh, sebaceous or atopic, yeah. um, they're both going to show similar uh, results to what's already shown in the literature, which is you tend to have less the acne um, and you tend to have more diversity. Um, and so uh, what we found was that when we looked, I'm sorry, I take that back. In the literature, I believe they showed less diversity in the atopic lesions, um, a more diversity in normative skin, but more the acne in normative skin. Um, when we tested this individual, we got a skin uh, diversity index, which means it measures the diversity level of how many different microbes there are on there. He got a lower level of diversity, so less diversity on the non-lesional skin and more diversity on the lesional skin. Now, uh, you could argue whether it's significant or not, but it, it looks like about half as diverse uh, based on their score. But interestingly, he had about 87% C-acnus on his healthy skin, and only 33% C-acnus on the lesional skin. And interestingly, we, uh, we're going to talk about um, the uh, topicals that we're making with C-acnus in them. When, we, when he used those, it actually, uh, I believe, ridded or uh, reduced. It certainly reduced his flares, yeah. So it actually was beneficial. Okay, so uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, make this a two-parter because we're only halfway through the discussion, and why not? So uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for listening, and uh, tune in next time when we finish this discussion on uh, biome care. Am I invited back? Uh, he will be back <laughs> in the same outfit, actually. Uh, so we're going to fly him back. Uh, no, uh, and so uh, we will talk about the rest of this later, so please do tune in. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your eyes and ears, and we hope you learned something. Uh, and remember, you have billions of bacteria on your face, and we think that's awesome. <laughs> All right, goodbye for now. 